Well, their hatred is nothing new. The elites have always hated, despised, really, Christianity. All through the Gospels, Jesus, Jesus narrowly escapes being lynched as the Pharisees, the elites, chased him. Uh, he told them he didn't come to call the righteous. He came to call the sinners, the blind, the disabled, the poor, the possessed. Now, anyone who actually hates Christianity actually really, I think, hates them as well. The blind, the disabled, the poor and the oppressed. Um, they seem to enslave them, give them. Anyway, if you want proof, look at how they attack anyone who disagrees with the elites. Chance of Black Lives Matter. Oh, that evaporates once a black person tells the world that they're a Republican, right? Believe all women unless they're conservative. Everything they claim, everything they say, oh, we believe in this so much is a distraction so that you won't notice what they're really up to. But as Paul writes in Romans, profess, uh, professing to be wise, they became fools. Doesn't it seem like our experts are foolish right now? Today's guest knows what they're really up to. He's a former pastor. Pastor. He is a author, a professor, and current dean of theology at African Christian University in Zambia. I've been waiting to meet this guy for a couple of years now. He happens to be in the States for a few days, and he stopped in. He's a spiritual man, a community leader, an academic, a Bible expert, and a man who strives to preserve the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Although he carries a pretty big stick as well. He's written books and articles detailing the complicated realities of a world that is increasingly dangerous for Christians. Today on the Glenn Beck podcast, I am excited to introduce you to Dr. Vody Bachman Jr. Before we get to uh, Vody, I want to talk to you a little bit about Relief Factor. There is a giant pain in my uh, that I can't seem to get rid of. And even Relief Factor doesn't help. I'm thinking November 8th might help a lot. But if that's not the pain you're experiencing and you have uh, pain every day and you just can't, you've tried everything, please, would you do me a favor and try Relief Factor? I hate to, I hate to paint this into such a, a corner of being, you know, your last attempt for anything. But those are the testimonials I see, the people who take the time to write because it's been a miracle in their life. It's been a miracle in my life. Uh, it, I'm out of pain. I can use my hands. It's unbelievable for me. But this is also something that, you know, instead of ibuprofen or Tylenol, this relief factor is great. Not a drug developed by doctors. It's all natural. You can get the three-week quick start to try for only $19.95. And 70% of the people who try it go on to order more. If you want a drug-free and natural way to get your life back, go to relieffactor.com, relieffactor.com. I find myself um, thinking thoughts I've never thought before. Yeah. Um, and wondering where are we in time where 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 are we as a people as a nation yeah you know i i, I tell you one thing we're in trouble <laughs> I, 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 I got I, that i know that. <laughs> got I, that i know that i know that we're in trouble i know that um there are things happening in the midst of our society that you know if you look at R romans chapter one or if you look at history, these are the kind of things that happen um, toward the end, end. Of, a, mm -hmm. of a society's um, lifespan, if you will. And uh, I, I think unless things change um, dramatically, that what we're gonna see is gonna be catastrophic. Um, I mean, I, I think on the other hand, that there are some unique aspects of American culture that uh, that kind of give us a reprieve. I think, you know, our federal system, the fact that there are 50 states, yeah. the fact that, and I think COVID showed us that, right? Mm -hmm. There wasn't, there wasn't one response to COVID Correct. in America, right? Correct. Yeah. Not everybody had the same experience. I think, um, 
you know, we, we, we see an end to Roe v. Wade, and now what happens? Things go to the states, and these different states look very different in their response. So I think because of that, you know. But that doesn't give us a rep- I, 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 I'm, I will be really, truly heartened um, that it's not a delay tactic. So some things like that, nice delays. Yeah. Um, buy us more time. Yeah. But until we, I mean, I hate to sound like a preacher, but until we recognize, crap, we have gone way astray, way <laughs> astray. I can't hear sheep. Yeah. I'm not, I mean, there's no sheep for miles around. We've really yeah. gone astray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. we then ask for forgiveness. Yeah. He, his protection is it has to come off of us. Yeah. Looking at the things that are happening in our society. But Glenn, I would say it already has. I would say that's why oh, yeah, we're yeah, yeah. seeing what yes. we're seeing. Yeah. But I, I don't think I, we this fu- is judgment. I'm not sure if you know? he's fully withdrawn. Yeah. We're not. We're at the begin. I yeah, think. Yeah. This is judgment. We're at the beginning of that. Yeah. This is we, this is judgment. We're experiencing judgment. And when you experience judgment, you're right. The response is to repent. And uh, you know, I'm I'm afraid that that we're not seeing much humility. of that. You we're, know, not we're not seeing any humility. We're not seeing humility. We're not seeing repentance. We're not seeing brokenness. Um, we will. Yeah. I think of Yoda. You yeah. will. Oh, you will. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, well, let me, let me, let me go here. I feel like we're battling evil. We are not, I keep saying on the air, it's not Republicans versus Democrats. It's not. It is elites versus the people, but it's not really even that. It is evil against good. Can you give, can you flesh that out? Yeah. I mean, I think the the Apostle Paul in in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind, that, that we are battling um, what he talks about in Ephesians chapter two is the prince of the power of the air, mm-hmm. right? That spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. This is a spiritual battle. It's always been a spiritual battle. And I, and I think that, that we're seeing that more clearly, you know, go back to Roe v. Wade. I, I talked about, you know, that earlier. What's interesting about that is, you know, all of a sudden when that happened, the gloves came off. Oh yeah. You know, and people were just essentially saying, I I can't believe we're not going to be allowed to kill babies anymore. I know. You you know, I know. I mean, no, I think it's been in some ways it's been a real blessing. Yeah. You know, if Donald Trump would have won again, I don't know if all of this would have been fully seen, you know what I mean? But now that things, uh, now that things are progressing as quickly as they are, you're hearing things like, yeah, we should let the baby die if we wanted to abort. Yeah. Then if he's born alive, then he should die. Crazy things that we all knew that men can have a baby. Yeah. That we know these things aren't true. That pedophilia is somehow okay. Because we're minor attracted persons. Now. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, <laughs> and it, I, I feel like saying, look, we all knew, we all knew 10 years ago, that stuff's crazy. If I would have said it, that you're going to be arguing for it, you would have called me insane. And now you're arguing, I didn't change. What happened to you? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's happening in many areas across the board. And unfortunately, what happens is we get numb to it. You know, it's kind of like the, the, the frog yeah, in the frog kettle, in right? Yep. We get numb to it. And for example, we're not talking about same-sex marriage anymore, oh. right? But I mean, we, we were, right. but now, you know, because of all of these other things that are I happening said, down the road. I, we're, we're, I said on the air yeah. when we were debating sex, same-sex marriage, to me, as a more of a rights person, I don't, what do you do in your life is your life. Do not force my church to do what you want. And I won't force your church to do what you want. You know what I mean? 
uh, or what I want. Um, uh, but I said, this opens up the door. You can't say man and a woman and then not say man, woman, woman or woman, woman, woman. Right. You, you, everything is going to change and you will see pedophilia will start to be normalized. And they said, how dare you ever right. say that? Right, right. That, no, and then they would say, no, that's not what we're arguing yes. for. Yes, yes. That's, you know, that, that whole slippery slope argument, yeah. that's not what we're arguing for. We're just arguing for this, not that. But the implications are clear. And there was a case in New York recently um, where I, I, I think there, were, there was a, a polyamorous triad. Three guys. Right, three guys. Three in guys. A polyamorous triad. Yeah, you know the case. Mm -hmm. and, and the judge is essentially pointing to the dissent in Obergefell mm -hmm. and saying the dissent is right. Right. When you get rid of the yep. male female requirement, the numerosity requirement makes no sense. Yep. It, 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 so essentially they're saying that slippery slope that you were arguing that we said was an overreaction. Yeah. It wasn't really an overreaction. Exactly. And we're right. there now. And for a long time in this movement, people have been trying to get rid of age of consent laws. So. We get rid of age of consent laws. We get rid of the numerosity requirement. And all of a sudden, um, marriage means absolutely nothing. And the foundation of civilization, right, um, is <laughs> gone. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you look at, there's a lot of things you can look at and say, ah, that's evil. I can see how you get there or. You know, maybe not, or whatever. But the things that are happening with children, that yeah. is the one thing that, you know, Christ wasn't really a fire and brimstone kind of guy, but it when, when it came to <laughs> harming his little ones. Better to have a millstone, millstone tied around your neck and be thrown into the deepest part of the sea. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so how is it yeah. so many people are just duped? Well, but listen, okay, we talk about the, the whole idea of the millstone, but don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So we, we've done this before. We've come up to an issue that from a biblical perspective and from an historical perspective was something that was absolutely unthinkable, right? And, and, and we cross that line. And now, you know, as we sit here, we're having a conversation about another line that we think should never even be approached, let alone crossed. But what history tells us is it's only a matter of time before we get to that one. Is it, is it exciting to live at this time or is it, what is it? <laughs> My father died, and I thought, you know, yeah. he he was too young to serve in World War II. Yeah. Um, he tried to join the Marines in Korea, but he had flat feet, so he couldn't go. Um, you know, it was a civil rights thing, but he lived up in Seattle, and, yeah. you know, uh, he really didn't have any time where he was pushed up against the wall by society yeah. or anything, you know. And I don't know if you can ever really truly be who you are meant to be until there's a force that is pushing against you. Yeah. So is it a good thing to live? <laughs> no. you, you know, it is. Um, first of all, you know, if we believe in, in, in a sovereign God and if we believe um, in his providence, then we're living exactly when and where we're supposed to be living. So that's number one. And secondly... I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's not until um, we face, face pressure and opposition um, that we actually see what we really believe and what we're really made of. And so, you know, these are frightening times. Terrifying. Um, but at the same time, um, they ought to be hope-filled times. Um, for those so of those who, I, who live with that kind of hope. I can't remember his name. Do you remember the guy? He went blind. He was a minister. He was in one of the concentration camps. And uh, he was a pastor. And he was he was happy. And everybody in his barracks was happy. And so they said, you got you to gotta beat him down. And they put him underneath the barracks. They didn't feed him. 
he went blind, but he was still singing in the end. Singing until they shot him in the head, finally. Same thing with Bonhoeffer. He thanked his executioner. Boy, I really want to get there. I don't know how to get there. How do you get there? You know, only by God's grace. I don't don't think that's something that that any of us... um, is necessarily prepared for until the time comes, you know, and um, you know we, of course, we we hope and pray that that the time doesn't come, but um, God gives us grace for whatever He calls us to. I was reading in the New York Times this week that uh, partial birth abortion doesn't exist. Yeah, it's apparently just a Republican talking point. Who knew? Huh? Really? Mm-hmm. And saying that an abortion where they cut the baby's limbs off and stuff, that's just a pejorative. Wow, I thought it was a baby that you were cutting out. Look, life is life. And... um I, I don't want to, I mean, unless it's a bug, I, I really don't want to take life. I don't. Especially human life. Kind of important things. Good safety tip. Preborn is a, um, is a ministry that we have um, partnered with. They are the largest provider of free ultrasounds in the country, and they are also the direct competitor to um, Planned Parenthood. We would like to, this year, by the end of the year, rescue 50,000 babies. When an expecting mom sees her child on an ultrasound, it's not a clump of cells anymore. It's a child. When she hears the heartbeat, which, by the way, doesn't exist. That's just a made-up sound out of the machine. Oh, my gosh. Really? Are we there? 80% of uh, moms are more likely to choose life. Preborn. They go beyond just the ultrasound. They provide maternity and baby clothes, diapers, car seats, counseling, books as the kids grow up. I mean, it's really good. And it's all free of charge. Preborn has a passion to save unborn babies from abortion and women to come see Christ. So over the past 15 years, they've canceled. uh, They've counseled over 450 women who were considering abortion. About 200,000 babies have been saved. 200,000 babies. Will you help us rescue a baby's life today? Donate, dial, pound 250, say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby, preborn.com slash Glenn. I was at a restaurant um, the other night, and somebody came in and just gave me the dirtiest look. And I'm like, okay, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, yeah. I looked around the restaurant and I saw all these young people, all these people just out doing their thing. Don't know how many of them even really know what's going on. Yeah. And I began to think how quickly they could be turned because there's not going to be anybody on the sidelines. You can't sit on the sidelines now, can you? No, neutrality is not an option. Yeah. So you have the... uh, burden of Ezekiel on your shoulders. How do you wake people? How do you, how do we wake people up? Boy, um, you know, ultimately that's not something that we can even do. Um, All we can do is be faithful and all we can do is continue to beat the drum, right? Um, All we can do is continue to warn people. Um, All we can do is, you know, continue to Try to be the watchman on the wall. I read something that you wrote, and it was about not using the name, you know, not not uh, associate, not associating your good works with the name. Um, and uh, I thought of, unfortunately, me a lot of times. I I try to look for language that is uniting, um, and that a lot it has become sin. Don't say that word. Mm-hmm. Sacrifice. Don't say that word. Judgment. Don't say. It. I mean, you really are out as somebody who believes in God. You're out of language. How important it is is it to use the language? What, yeah. how- you, but here's what's interesting, Glenn. 
we we feel like that or we've felt like that but now all of a sudden the other side has absolutely no problem using that language they have no pro- i mean you know Gavin Newsom you know, puts bible verses on billboards advertising for people to come to California to slaughter their babies right when 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 um you know madam vice president wanted to encourage everybody to 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 get the jab um she she no problem quoting scripture in order to do that right the president has no problem quoting scripture and the press doesn't run around with their hair on fire if you do it on the left because i think they right? don't i think they think that's just pandering yeah. They really do. They think well, they're just saying that. To yeah, get they, those don't, they don't really believe it. They don't believe it. They don't really believe it. Yeah, right. But then if somebody believes what they're actually then saying, then it's a problem. Now all of a sudden they run around with their hair on fire. So, um, you know, I, I I think it I think it's important for us to be open and honest about and what we believe and where we're coming from, and unashamed about what we believe and where we're coming from. You know, um, especially when and, and I, I'm I'm you know all this this talk about, you know, Christian nationalism, you know, um, this ooh, <laughs> Christian nationalism. Have you ever heard a preacher <laughs> preach any of that nonsense? Well, actually, I have. Have you? Unfortunately, you know, I have. But is but, it is it prominent? But but no, no. Yeah, okay. But there but there there are people who do that. There are people on the fringes who do that. But, you know, the 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 problem with people who are running away from it is that what these people are running away from is our foundations, right? They're, they're, they're trying to act like America has always been this secular republic that never acknowledged God. Never, not true. Right? They, and, and the danger in that is we are the freest, most prosperous, most tolerant Right. Yeah. That's that's who we've been since our our founding because of the foundations upon which we're built. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the place where, you know, um, Jews and and, and Catholic, Mormon, even I mean, everybody. Right. This is the place where people can have that kind of liberty. Now, you and I know because we've been to other parts of the world. That, like that, that does not exist. Where does it exist? In the Christian West. That's where it exists. And so the great irony is that when we run away from that, um, we're running away from the very thing that has given us the freedoms that we enjoy. So let me ask you, is um, Christianity seems to be diminishing quickly in the West. Yeah. Um, the numbers are, are quickly diminishing. Um, and I, in some ways, I, I wonder how much our churches are responsible. Some have made it so easy to be a Christian that you don't really have to question anything except other people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or they've made it about money and success and um, it's not about principles. And I don't see, I mean, I, I don't like when preachers get into politics, but I'm not talking about politics. We are so far beyond politics. We are in basic bedrock principles. Yeah. And they're afraid to do it. Yeah. Well, the, it, this is where I go back to the unique nature of the American landscape. And the fact of the matter is, um, most of the things that go by the name church <laughs> um, are, are not. Right. Right. Um, but, but there's a remnant. And unfortunately, most of those people who are being faithful and who are being consistent um, are tucked away in places where you don't necessarily know their name. And uh, as a result of that, it, it, it sort of looks like everybody's, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. sold the farm and right. everybody's, you know, gone astray. Um, but doesn't that happen? Yeah. Awakenings don't happen in the church usually. 
they, hand, they, they happen outside of the church, or at least the big power structure of the church. Do they not? They yeah. start with individuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, outside the power structure and start with individuals and, start, yeah. and, and really, you know, kind of go, go, you know, beyond the walls. Yeah. Um, sort of by, by definition. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it, it, the interesting thing, though, is like, like right now, we need awakening inside <laughs> as much as, if not more than outside. You know, over these last couple of years, it's been shocking um, to see the number of people who have been willing to embrace ideologies that are not just unbiblical, but anti-biblical. Yeah. You know? that's It's changed. It, it used to be, you used to be able to say, well, I can see if you're really misguided how you think that way. Now it's like, no, this you're not. This is antichrist stuff. Not yeah. the antichrist, but this is antichrist. Yeah. This is opposite of what the Bible would would teach. So it's not like we've decayed and are kind of sloppy on it. No, no, no. Yeah. We've decayed to a point to where there's a side standing up going, all of that is evil. Good yeah. is evil and evil is good. Yeah. And I think part of that is because we were kind of lulled into it. I mean, think think about movies and television and the portrayal of Christianity, right? If there's a positive portrayal of Christianity in the movies or on television, it's either somebody who's a political leftist, mm-hmm. right? It's it's the minister or the priest who's out there fighting for social justice. Mm-hmm. Or it's the person who's running a soup kitchen, right? Um, you know, or it's the person who's, you know, running an orphanage, or it's a, the only positive pictures of Christianity are those pictures that are social gospel mm-hmm. pictures, right? Mm-hmm. And if anybody is, you know, in any way, you know, conservative or anything else, then those are the images of Christianity that are basically the Christian Taliban, mm-hmm. you know, if you will. And I think in many instances, um, Christians decided, no, you know, we want to be thought well of. So we've emphasized, you know, those social so, issues and but, social aspects. But Christ would that. have us do those things. So shouldn't those two sides be the same coin? Yeah, but if you do those without the gospel, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that's my point. Okay. Yeah. Is that those are the only things okay. that we're seeing. Sure. And we see those things because of, you know, the sort of universal brotherhood of man sort of mm-hmm. ideas, right? Nothing connected to Christ and the gospel, right? Nothing connected to this idea of sin and redemption, Nothing create, you know, no, no, nothing that, that gets you to, you know, here's our biblical worldview and this is our response because of our, our biblical worldview. It's just this sort of, there's the universal brotherhood of man. There's a group of people out there who are good people and they're good people because they do these sorts of social things. Correct. Right. Mm-hmm. And the Christians who join the ranks of these good people and do these good social things are good people, not because they're Christians, but in spite of the fact that they are Christians because they've joined this group over here that does these good things. And and I think what has happened is there are a lot of people who sort of bought into that. Yeah. And, and that's the face that they, that they want to show because the new Christ is one of just do good things. Listen, just be good. The 11th commandment is thou shalt be nice. And we don't believe the other 10. (laughs) It is. Yeah, it is. Um, Talk to me a little bit about the You you talked a little bit about the church. You're a Southern Baptist. You were, you almost (laughs) became the head of the Southern Baptist. (laughs) No, not not Um, quite, but (laughs) you were, I don't think the votes were pretty close and I I don't, that's not to disparage the other man or anything, but um what what happened what why yeah. were you well, standing up and yeah there there's a couple of things that happened there and first 
um, I was asked to uh, allow my name to be put forward as president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And even before I had um, processed that, you know, agreed to it or whatever, um, the news kind of leaked. So the, you know, left-wing progressives within and without the Southern Baptist Convention just went on the attack. Oh, I bet they did. And it, it, was, it was brutal. I mean, it really was. Attacks on me, attacks on my family, attacks. It just, it was bad. And I hadn't even, you know, I, 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 my, my hat wasn't in the ring. Right? <laughs> but just because it was rumored. Um, and then what happened is some of the powers that be, you know, went, <clears throat> you know, deep into the, to the books and the bylaws. And, you know, they said, well, technically, you know, because this guy lives outside the country and because he's a member of a church that's outside the country, technically, um, he's really? not eligible to, he's not eligible to even put his hat in the ring. And so I know, thought I thought your hat was in the ring. No, oh, so boy. what happened was, um, you know, a, a, a group of the brethren who had asked me to put my hat in the ring. And we, we basically said, OK, fine, you can't do that. But there's another position. Mm. Right. Um, president of the SBC Pastors Conference, which, again, there's a whole nother story about, mm-hmm. you know, why that would have been significant. And so myself and another brother. Tom Askell. Tom Askell accepted a nomination as president of the convention. I accepted a nomination as president of the pastor's conference really to sort of, you know, run, you know, with him. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, we were in Anaheim and a little inside baseball here. The further the convention meeting is away from the South, Mm -hmm. um, the more to the left, Crazy. It, yeah, of course. You know, tends to be. Of course. So you know, we di- we didn't have much of a shot uh, uh. going to Anaheim, but um, both of us um, were willing to do that because we feel like it was. It's almost like a last ditch effort. Um, it, it, it's almost like if this thing doesn't turn around. Um, kind of like what we were saying about you know mm-hmm. America. If, if this thing doesn't turn around, um, we're in trouble. Um, so we both um, allowed, our, allowed ourselves to um, to be subjected to that, wow. um, you know, for for those for those purposes. And neither one of us um, ended up um, so winning those races. What? I mean, it's because your, your denomination is not alone. Uh, it is infiltrated. Somebody asked me today, how did it even get into the churches? Liberation theology. I'm guessing is that how it first or how did how did this yeah. perverse anti-Christian yeah. kind of message or anti-Christ yeah. sort of message yeah. get I, in? I think a number of things and you're talking about you like the whole social justice yeah, and all, all this other stuff. You, I, I think for many social for, for many Southern Baptists, let me say two things. Number one, the overwhelming majority of Southern Baptist churches are not there. They're, they're just not. Um, so I think, the, though, the, what's crazy is our government is there. Yeah. But the vast majority of Americans yes, are, are not, not there. there. Yeah, but not there. that disconnect yes. between the two yes. Yes. is yes. dangerous. It's, it's absolutely dangerous. Um, it, but I think what, what led people to even um, entertain this is the subtlety, right? Social justice. I mean, if you don't if you don't know what that means, and you're a Christian, you're like, well, yeah, right? Anti racism, <laughs> of course, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, it, and so I, I can't racial, tell you how many people I've racial had racial justice. Yeah, I've had so many conversations right? with that and say, yeah, yeah the label sounds yes. good, just like the Inflation yes. Reduction Act <laughs> sounds good. Sounds, That's not what it is. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Inflation Reduction Act. Well, what does it do? Um, not that. Yeah, it, it causes more inflation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I think for a lot of people, right. Um, Again, when you're talking about people who love the Lord and who love their fellow man, right, and they see people in pain, right, mm-hmm. and, 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 and despair and anguish, 
and, and people are saying, you know, mm-hmm. there's this injustice out there and we need to be about social justice and racial justice and anti-racism and da 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 I, I think there is a tendency for folks to say, yes. well, yes, mm-hmm. you know, um, and, and it's not only until later. Um, I was talking to somebody, I guess the day before yesterday, who was uh, in Denton and they, they, college student and they were out and, you know, there was a Black Lives Matter march. And so I think he was with his sister or somebody and. You know, people were like, you know, Black Lives Matter, and they're marching, and this, that, and the other. And his sister's like, you want to join them? And he goes, yeah, I think we should, you know. Mm-hmm. And he said, mm-hmm. they marched for a little while, and all of a sudden they realized, you know what, this might not be what we, this might not be what we thought it was. <laughs> right, you know? yeah. yeah. And I think that there are a lot of people who, on a you know broader scale, had that experience. And I, I think they began to use the terminology. They began to perhaps even, you know, try to get involved. And then slowly but surely, the masks came off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they realized that this this is not what we thought it was. And I think even more significantly than that, the premise was wrong. Um, so people always, for me, when people start talking about, you know, racial justice and this mm-hmm. justice, I, I say, okay, let's back up and de- tell me how you're defining injustice, right? And then when they say, well, we're defining injustice as, you know, disparate outcomes, mm-hmm. right? We're not saying that there's, you know, no, nobody's saying, hey, there's a lunch counter over there mm-hmm. that's saying that people who look like this or belong there, they can't come to the lunch mm-hmm. counter, right? Because you and I both know if that's the case, then we posse up and we go. We go. We, we go, right? We go with you. They're not saying that. They're mm-hmm. saying, no, 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 no. They're, they're, there's these disparate outcomes, right? And, and these outcomes only exist because of the racism that's baked into the system. And so we've got to go and deconstruct this and fix these disparate outcomes. I, I call it chasing ghosts, right? Yeah. And, and so, you know, that's, so that's what I want to know. You tell me what the injustice is, and then I'll tell you whether or not I'm going to partner with you in order to correct that injustice. Because what you're defining as injustice may not be injustice at all. And it, off, it, it often isn't. Two decades ago, somebody came up with the idea of covenant eyes because he faced the same questions many people face today. I have children. How can I keep them safe on the Internet? I mean, and you get online and all of a sudden it's just everywhere. How do I guard my own heart and remain pure online? How do I serve as an example to my family and my church? It was this mission in mind that covenant eyes was created and they created their own world-class software and educational resources which are now being used over uh, by a million people covenant eyes wants to help you as a parent and a grandparent and wants to help you uh, with your family wants to help you uh, stay away from pornography yourself they have resources that will help protect your family. They want to give you a free parenting ebook called Connected. The book explores uh, how a strong family connection can actually protect children and teens from the dangers of hidden pornography use. It contains real life stories and practical tips for maintaining or reestablishing connection in your family. This book is going to help strengthen your relationship with God, your spouse, and your children so your family can live a life free of the evils that surround pornography use. So, would you please call, get your free copy of Connected, text GLEN to 66866. That's GLEN, G-L-E-N-N, to 66866. Most of these Marxist things um, are really the same, aren't they? They're yes. just, they're all about tear you apart from yeah. your family, tear you apart from your own self-worth yeah um tear you apart from uh any kind of religious belief that teaches you that you are unique and special and you know that winning isn't 
that's not justice. Justice yeah. isn't found in in that stuff. Yeah. Um, aren't they all pretty much based on just the destruction of the individual? At the end of the day, they're based on power, right? And it's ironic because, you know, what they do is they set up this paradigm and this paradigm says, you know, everything is about power dynamics. And there are these people who have power and they set up the system in order to maintain that power and they oppress people, you know, who don't have power. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, of course, therefore, Mm -hmm. tear them down and give us power. Correct. Right. Because we'll because we'll handle it the right. Right. Way, right. right. We, we won't we won't be like them. And so essentially it's all about power. So you talked about, for example, you know, the, the family um, and the church. And why are the family and the church, for example, enemies to the Marxist? Mm-hmm. Because. Challenge of power. Yes. Yes. If you have a family that is raising you in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, right? Ephesians 6, 4. If you have a church that is proclaiming, you know, (laughs) law and gospel and pointing you to faith in Christ and developing, you know, biblical worldview, if these things are happening in your life, then Marxism's not going to be able to get its hooks in you Mm -hmm. like it can if we can Mm -hmm. divorce you from your family and divorce you from your your church. It's a cult. That's exactly what a cult does. Yes, 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 absolutely. And so that's why, because it's all about power, and it's all about removing those things that, that are a threat to that power. I think it's important to um, which, which again, Black Lives. Remember Black Lives Matter yeah. on their website before yeah, yeah. they changed it, right? Destruction well, of the nuclear yes. family. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. Yeah. So, but it's power. It's their power. Yes, by disempowering you yes. or anyone else that they don't select. Yes. It it yes. takes. I mean. It, I, the World Economic Forum has been talking about ESG and all yes. of this crap. And yes. their their goal, they say, is by 2030, you will own nothing and you'll yeah. be happy. Yeah. A, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, but I do think they could get us to a place to where we own nothing. Yeah. But it has to be destroy it. They, you have you can't take you, you that. You, much. Don't, you don't have to destroy it. You, you just have to basically. Um, you know, take it, give it to the state. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, <laughs> you have to take it or destroy it. Yeah. state. You know, you destroy yeah. the individual's yeah. ability to yeah. maintain or have, or any of that. I, I think I said in, in some of our discussions before that I'm telling people that, you know, the, the, the three most important books right now are the Bible, 1984 and Animal Farm. <laughs> it is. It is. You know, it it's is. Just, it's crazy. We're seeing it. You I know? know. I know. We're, we're watching it right now. We're we're watching the rules on the wall be changed. You know, from 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 day to day. Yeah. You know, um, and, and and again, we're we're watching those people who, on the one hand, talk about despising, um, you know power and power dynamics but i do everything that they can to accumulate power for themselves talk to me a little bit about um well first of all the southern baptists do they believe in do you believe in um the rapture well some southern baptists do some southern baptists don't there's forty seven thousand southern baptist churches and um you know, when you start talking about eschatology, mm-hmm, right, mm-hmm. and 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 end times, there's different groups and different camps. Yeah, um, and so that's not an area uh, where Southern Baptists um, rule would, one way or another. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's, yeah. I so want this to be true because I have a lot of Southern Baptist <laughs> friends, and they're like, "Yeah, Christ <laughs> is coming," and I'm like, it. "Oh, I hope you're true. I I hope that He yeah. takes me too." Take me <laughs> you yeah. know. Um, but I I uh, yeah. I worry about some of my friends because people have. I mean, I personally think we're living in the latter days, yeah. but they've been thinking about that. The apostles thought that. Yeah. Okay? yeah. And if you don't do the things you're supposed to, if you're just like. The bus is going to come pick me up before yeah. it happens. If the bus doesn't yeah. show up, yeah. you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Yeah. So um, 
talk to me a little bit about. I, I just I, I keep coming back to this with you. I feel like. Uh, teach us how to prepare, how to be obedient, what the important obedience and endurance. I said to my kids when they were young. That's what life is really all about. Obedience yeah. and endurance. And they were like, Dad, you make it sound like life's a drag. And I'm like, if you have those two things down, it's not. Right. If you don't right. recognize that, right. it's going to be a hell show. Right. Yeah. You know, I was talking about um, 2 Corinthians 10 earlier. And, you know, if you continue on in that, that, that first paragraph there in that chapter, you get to this two-pronged approach, right? And it's... You know, we destroy every argument and lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of Christ. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's what we have to do. That's how we prepare. And I like to talk about those in reverse. Number one, take every thought captive to obey Christ. And one of the Expl major, explain one of the major problems that we have is that people have not taken every thought captive. In other words... They have this kind of bifurcated view of life. And they say, over here yeah. is God, and over here is Jesus, and over here is salvation, and over here is church, right? And here's my, that spiritual part of my life. And then over here is politics and economics and you know all these other things. And so we're, we're not bringing this under this umbrella. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have a full orbed biblical theological understanding of civics, for example. So I know you're, I know you're a history guy, right? So if we look, you know, pietism, you know, takes hold. Pietism is the idea that basically, um, you know, we're just here to be religious people in church, mm -hmm. not involved in that secular world or, you know, whatever, right? Liberalism. Let's say, you know, again, we're back 1920s, 30s, you know, liberalism takes hold and the fundamentalists respond, J. Gresham Machen and so on and so forth. Now, now fundamentalism is a, you know, it's a pejorative, right? Mm -hmm. But when I say fundamentalism, I mean, those people who said no to the liberals, no, we believe in the fundamentals. You're denying the virgin birth, right? You're denying the resurrection. You're denying the supernatural. So the fundamentalists say, no, 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 we believe in those fundamentals of the faith. Hmm. We move forward, you know, in history, and all of a sudden we get this kind of, the, the sort of religious right movement, right? Now, the religious right movement um, was a powerful movement but it was based on their ability to get people organized and motivated and, and, and out, you know, Correct. to vote and whatnot. But it was a mile wide and half an inch deep. The theological foundations weren't there. It was just activism for activism's sake. It was things are bad. We'll give you a voter guide. Go vote for the guys that we tell you to vote for, and then we'll turn this thing around because we voted for the right guys. And that's not the answer. Mm -hmm. We have to take every thought captive to obey Christ. I don't just need to know who to vote for. I need to know why I'm voting. Amen. Right? Yes. I, I don't I don't just I need I don't just need to know I like this policy. I don't like that policy. What's wrong with this policy? Like like fundamentally, what's wrong with this policy? See, so I need to all of Christ for all of life. Take every thought captive to obey Christ and destroy every argument and lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. That's the two pronged war that we fight. Number one, having this, you know, full orbed, well developed biblical worldview. And then number two, with that, being able to say, um, no, that's problematic because. No, he's problematic because. Right? It's not enough to just say, you know, no, we're, you know, going to vote against this, that, or the other. You know, we're, we're going to be pro life. Why are you going to be pro life? From a biblical theological perspective, why are you going to be pro-life? 
talk to me about being created in the image of God and having inherent dignity, worth, and value, right? Talk to me about the sanctity of human life because of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, who doesn't just come into the world as a full-grown man in order to redeem and ransom humanity. He comes as an embryo, right? Thereby sanctifying human life from its very origins and beginnings all the way through to its natural end, right? So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. We've got to be able to think through these things biblically so that nobody just can can come and, you know, just drag us by the nose, right? And for us to be carried away by every wind of doctrine. So it's a long way around to answering your no, question. No, no, it's a good right? answer. But, yeah. So uh, take me to, and I don't know if you can off the top of your head, but take me to, you said economics need to be brought under. Yeah. Talk to me about our economics, what we're doing right now. How yeah. How is God in that? Yeah, in what we're doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> or what we should be doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Why is yeah. this wrong, what we're doing right yeah. now? And it, p- partly because it's theft, right? I mean, that's, that's the main reason that it's wrong, is because we're actually taking from people to render um, unto Caesars, what do you in, mean? In order, in order to, in order to give to other people. Right? But wait, isn't that render unto Caesars? Um, sort of, <laughs> right? Um, but but what are we rendering unto Caesar for? Well, why does Caesar exist? What is Caesar's purpose, right? Under you when know, Jesus time, though, Caesar was, you know, what, what, he yeah, was not yeah, a good. No, no, absolutely. But we have to understand what the purpose of government is. Yes. Right. To protect rights. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And to, you know, encourage what is good mm-hmm. and to punish what is evil. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, th- th- that's that's government's purpose. Um, it's not government's purpose, for example, to be in the business of raising children. It's not government's purpose, um, you know, to be in the business even of taking care of the poor. That that's not their sphere, right? And, it's our and, sphere and, and the that, churches. That, it absolutely is. So from that standpoint, you know, Abraham Kuyper um, he, he had the, you know the, this big idea of sphere sovereignty, right? God gives us these institutions. He gives us the family. He gives us the state, mm-hmm. and he gives us the church. These three different spheres, right? Mm-hmm. And these three different spheres um, have certain responsibilities, and they have sovereignty in those you know particular spheres. And what we have is we've got these jurisdictional usurpations of sphere sovereignty. Like the government basically, you know, usurping the sphere sovereignty of the home, of the family. So, again, but just particularly back to economics, um, the idea of personal property, the idea of personal responsibility, the idea of, you know. How is personal property tie into the Lord? Yeah, well, I mean, we're told, for example, in the Bible that we shouldn't move, you know, the, the you know ancient uh, landmarks. Um, you know, we're we're the idea of people's property being their own in the New Testament. You know, Ananias and Sapphira. Everybody talks about you know, Ananias and Sapphira because you know God judges them uh, because they withheld, you know, part of the money mm-hmm. that they got, you know, from the sale of their their home. The problem wasn't that they, you know, didn't give that up, right? Peter says, you know what? Before you sold that, that was yours. But then you sold it and you said that you were, mm. you were going to give it, right? right? That's where the judgment came. But before you sold that, that was yours. It didn't belong to someone else. It belonged to you, right? Um, I mean, you know, the respect for the respect for personal property, the stewardship of personal property. Um, you know, the parable of the talents. You know, I, I mean, there, all of these things mm-hmm. um, are clearly outlined 
in the scriptures, if we are willing to study to show ourselves approved, if we're willing to, you know, tease these things out. And not only that, but we also see um, the, the things that are wrong. When government, for example, begins to usurp the sphere of the family, um, you know, families, by the way, were meant to be places of, um, you know, not just consumption, mm -hmm. places of production, right? Um, so anyway. Let me, um, let me build on that a bit with, with this question. Um, how do you... How do you balance uh, just recently with now the military is now flying military members out of state to be able to get abortions? So not only is the government paying for the abortion with yeah. my money, yeah. but they're also paying for the flight and they're encouraging all of these things I stand firmly against. Um, and they become abusive really abusive to things that I hold sacred, not that I like, not that, but sacred. How do you, how do you square that circle with, you know, obeying your governments? And yeah. Here's what's interesting. Um, we're, <laughs> we're not necessarily called to obey our government in everything. Nobody can command what God forbids. And nobody can forbid what God commands. Okay. COVID regulations, notwithstanding <laughs> that that was inappropriate. Mm -hmm. The government does not have the right to tell the church that she can't meet, for example. Mm -mm. And I think we have, for example, in, in, in Acts chapter four, we have an example of this when, you know, Peter and, and, and John are told not to, you know, preach or teach anymore in, in the name of Jesus. And their response is right. Whether it is right to obey you rather than God, you be the judge. But we cannot stop speaking about what we've heard. Um, when the Apostle Paul is in the in jail in Philippi, he's been jailed there, and eventually they find out that he's a Roman citizen. And you know, you, okay, you go. No, I'm not going. You bring the magistrate here, right? He jailed me illegitimately, right? Um, so. As Christians, um, our position is not that the state just, you know, has the right to do whatever the state wants to do. Mm -hmm. As Christians, on the one hand, no one has the right to command what God forbids or forbid what God commands, right? Um, and out of deference to the state, we're willing to accept whatever punishment we have to accept when Correct. we say no, right? Correct. But on the other hand, as citizens, we have rights. And here's the other thing, as Americans, we're in a very unique position. And again, all of Christ for all of life, right? Most Americans look at like Romans 13, you know, um, I think that, you, that you're alluding to. And they say, well, you know, according to Romans 13, you know, we have to submit to them. Guess what? As an American, do you know what my governing authority is? It's not an individual. It's God. It's God is ultimately my governing yeah. authority, but as an American citizen, my it's governing authority is the Constitution. Constitution. Yes. Correct. That's my governing authority. And everybody is held to that governing authority. So one of the problems that we have is we don't know what it says. So when this person says something that's completely out of line with that, well, we go, oh, I, I guess I'm supposed to do it. No. What you might ought to do is confront that based on the fact that they are not obeying what we're all, mm -hmm. you know, agreed to obey, which is our Constitution. We are a we're, we're a constitutional republic. Right. There's people going to jail now. You said yeah. you have to take, you know, responsibility. And they are taking responsibility. But they are being unjustly, I believe, unjustly held. Yeah. 11 years in prison is insanity. Yeah. Um, it's a misdemeanor if that, if that. 
Um, for what are you talking for? For the abortion, the Face Act. Have you? No, 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 no. Oh, you haven't heard this? No. So you know, I live in uh, Africa. Now. Yeah, I know you live in <laughs> Africa. Um, so the FBI has rounded up 12, 11 or twelve people now. Um, one of them is like an eighty-four-year-old grandmother who was praying at the entrance of an abortion clinic. Uh, at the time, the abortion clinic um, came and told them they had to go. Uh, some of them, some of them were um, uh, hit with a misdemeanor for trespassing, I think, um, and it was over two years ago. The DOJ has started opening up cases now of those misdemeanors that were just misdemeanor and dismissed, and they are now charging them with a face act, which is blocking the entrance, and they are facing eleven years. Wow. Our government is completely wow. out of control. Wow, 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 wow. Well, you know, we have a recourse. Right. We have a recourse, you know. Right. So at, 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 the, at, at the ballot box. Right. You know, so what so what I have a recourse at the ballot box. What I want to ask also the jury box. I want to ask you <laughs> because that's my response. Yeah. Um but where do you think where do you think the Lord stands on difference between protecting yourself and going out and uh, creating violence or looking for violence to correct it? Where do you think the Lord is on peace and yeah, well, advancing? We, well, we don't look for violence. I mean, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will right. repay, right? So, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty clear line there. But at the same time... Um, you know, d defending our own lives. Um, that's different. You know, that's, that's, if that's they come different. for me and yeah. they're trying to take my life or tr take yeah. my children's lives, yeah. I don't have an obligation to let you kill me. Yes. <laughs> so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, let's, let's change the subject to um, the culture a bit. It is almost impossible to um, ride the culture. Right now, I, I saw some things on um, on Twitter yesterday that are happening in our inner cities, where uh, th this crowd was just beating this guy down, black on black, beating him down, just kicking him in the head, vicious. His his girlfriend, wife, I don't know, came and. Um, actually put her body over his head because they were kicking him in the head he just lifted up and slapped her out slapped her out knocked her out i see a video of these guys on stage doing vile vile things on stage um and then the next video related to that was these kids this tall doing that and actually having adults around encouraging it. What the hell's happened? Where, how, how do we, where is anyone stopping this? Yeah. This, this, is, this is that, that Romans 1, you know? This is that, that 2 Timothy 3. This is that devolution of, of culture. And it, it's incredibly sad um, to watch, but it seems incredibly like, discouraging to watch. But, it's so discouraging. Yeah, Kanye but, has stood up against yeah. this and was brutalized. Yeah. for it. Yeah, um, you know, and I don't. Yeah, yeah, I don't know about. I, I, I really, honestly, don't yeah. know about Kanye. Yeah. where he's at, but I mean, he at least was speaking out against it. Yeah, and but you know, here's the deal: that comes from somewhere, right? Um. That, that comes from brokenness, that, and it comes from a broken worldview. It, it comes from um, a devaluation of humanity, um, not to mention our fallenness in sin, right? So, you know, man is fallen and, and sinful. That's the problem internally. And then the culture is broken and fallen and sinful, and that's the problem externally. And then what we don't have is we don't have, 
you know, the state, again, that sphere, doing and being what it's supposed to do and be, right? And courage, that which is good, and punish that which is evil. Instead, they're encouraging that which is evil and often punishing that which is good. So that, that causes this to mushroom, right? Um, and then, of course, if from the individual perspective, we're not coming at that with law and gospel, if we're not coming at that with the law that points us to our need for Christ, and if we're not coming at that with the gospel, right, that shows how what we need is repentance and faith, but instead church just becomes, like we talked about earlier, just this sort of social institution, right, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, or some other perversion, you know, of, of this gospel, I mean, where else are we going to go but see more of this? Is, um, how, is Satan real? Yes. yes. So describe what the is it? The prince of the power of the air yeah, who is what now is at he? work in the sons of disobedience. Yeah, there, there, is a, there is a real devil. There is real evil. But, you know, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, those first, you know, three verses, we see this triad, right? We do see Satan. We do see the devil. Um, and he is real. Um, he is a fallen angel. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is at work in the sons of disobedience. Uh, uh, and so... Father of all lies, father fa- of all absolutely, chaos. Absolutely, absolutely. We do see that. But we also see the world, right? This, this world, this world system that we live in, Okay that teaches us what to think, why to think, when to think, okay, mm-hmm. how to think. Um, it teaches us, you know, wh- wh- what to desire, when to desire. So we see the world, and they also see the flesh. We are fallen in Adam. And we inherit um, a sin nature from Adam because of our fallen Adam. Now you put these together, it's the world, the flesh, and the devil, and that's what gets you this chaos that we find ourselves in. And again, when we're encouraging that and when we're calling good evil and evil good, um, we're just, we're pouring, we're pouring gasoline on that fire. The people who are, um, I think there's a small number of people who know they're doing the bidding of evil. Um, and I don't even know who they are, don't I, you know, but I think there are those who know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but most part, the others are not. Is that, uh, is that why we're supposed to love our enemy? Because they're by the grace of God, go I. There's, I was just talking to somebody who, who wrote um, the book, uh, the, oh, I can't remember. But it, it's, on, uh, it's on fascism and what we're going through right now. And he said there's this, not to get into Gnostic kind of belief, but there's this, there's a percentage of people who when this stuff happens, they just, and he said, I don't know why, but they just don't go there. They just don't, they see the world differently than the 70%. You know what I mean? And they're from the beginning going, what are you guys doing? Um, And I don't believe that we were born just knowing, I don't believe any of that. Um, But, but there's a difference between the leadership and those who have just fallen slowly and don't even know, isn't there? Yeah, there absolutely is. And and most people, fall into that category of follower, you know, and who, who've, you know, fallen slowly and, and don't really know. Um, but, but back to your, your question about, you know, loving our enemies, the, you, you're right. I mean, there were, for the grace of God, go I. But also, these are people who are made in the image of God. There um, are, you know, are brothers and yeah, sisters, and he are, wants these, all these of his people, kids back. These are people who are made in the image of God, um, and, and our, our desire, my desire for that individual is 
for them to come to repentance and faith. My desire is for their sin to be nailed to the tree. My desire is for Christ to have the fullness of the reward for which he died. That's my desire. Um, Now, if it were not for the fact that I know that God is going to set everything right, then, you know, I would feel like I had to right every wrong, and I would feel like I had to exact vengeance. Correct. I don't, right? Whatever those wrongs are, they're either going to be punished um, upon that person if they don't come to repentance and faith or nailed to the cross, right? But in either way, it is not incumbent upon me to bring about that judgment. And the other thing is, again, back to what you said there, but for the grace of God, you know, my sin was nailed to the tree. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I placed my faith in the finished work of Christ. So I'm not who I am um, because I figured it out. I'm not who I am because I'm inherently better than anyone. Um, you know, I, I am who I am and, and I stand where I stand because of God's grace to me through the person and work of Christ. So that, that, that takes away boasting, as Paul yeah. would say in Romans, right? There, there's no room for boasting. Right. Yeah. Uh, you're going back to Africa tonight. Tonight, right? yeah. Yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I used to think, you know, go to Australia, go to New Zealand. Now I think, no, there's really no place. There's no place. But what do you, what do you, why Africa? Yeah, why well, the pull? Um, you know, I, I'm in Zambia, down in, in South Central Africa, and um, really, I, I went there to to help start uh, a university, to help start the African Christian University, and it it was a fit, you know, it, it was a fit. My gifts, talents, abilities, and desires um, were, were were just a, a fit for this need and for this unique opportunity, and it is a very unique opportunity. In a country about the size of Texas, um, with you know about half the population, mm-hmm. um, it's a constitutionally Christian republic. Um, th- there's receptivity there, you know, to to the gospel, and and there's just there's there's an opportunity um, to do something with with lasting impact, and you know, and so it, it, we're there. <laughs> yeah, I'm just. I, I ask you this um, because I I know why you're there. But um, you know, people who will listen to you and hear you, I know they are like, "Come back to America. You're a voice we really need." Does that ever t- pull at you? No, really. No, it, it it doesn't. It really doesn't. I think for a couple of reasons. One, you know, I have opportunities to. I, I come back three or four times a year, and I'm here for about you know ten or twelve days during different speaking tours. And I get to see and be around um, and have relationships with with folks who get it and who are doing incredible work. Right? What do you what did what did um, you what did you feel from Africa that when you arrived you didn't have locked in? Do have you learned anything about where we are or what's happening that you couldn't feel or see from across the water? I think the speed with which it's happening. I come back about once a quarter, and it's crazy. You know, when I see certain things, I, I was watching. Um, I was watching something the other day. I was. It's probably like a football game or something. I don't get to watch football games anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, so when I'm here, mm-hmm. you know, I, I go to a restaurant with people, and you know how they have the games yeah, on, yeah, yeah. and I'm the guy who's. Yeah. You know, doing all this, I, just, I just don't get to see them anymore. You know, I've got eleven days. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I saw a commercial. I think it was a commercial for you know some kind of pharmaceuticals or something, maybe an AIDS drug or something, and it was just open, blatant. Um, you know, just in your face, and and I was I'm sitting there, you know, my jaw <laughs> practically on the ground, yeah. and I'm going, wait, what? What what am what am I seeing right now? And people around me are going, oh yeah, you know. So I think for me, 
you know, being oh, away know. and then coming back. It's good. It, it just really does. You know, the other thing is, um, cause we moved in 2015. So we were there at the end of the Obama administration and you know, I'm a, I'm a news guy, you know, and mm-hmm. talk radio news, whatever. And I, you know, I stay up on what's happening and, and, you know, think about things, I try to think about things. And, uh, you know, and I go over there and I'm listening to, you know, BBC Africa and to their reporting on the Obama administration and on America. And it's, and I'm going, what are they talking about? Like, like wh- wh- where, where are they getting this from? You know? Mm-hmm. And so, and then of course, you know, Trump wins and, you know, talk about people running around with their hair on fire, right? Oh yeah. Um, and so it's just really interesting to be in another country mm-hmm. and listen to the way that people um, perceive what's what's going on in America. Mm-hmm. And then the, the the third thing is being in a in a developing country. Um, I have so come to appreciate what we have in America. Things that people take for granted, right? Such as? Infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Um, but not just infrastructure. Just the, the cultural differences. For example, you come to a four-way stop at most places in the United States, mm-hmm. and people will stop and take turns. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't do that. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's the Wild West, man. Wow. You know, you come to, you know, you come to it because, you know, we got you know, traffic mm-hmm. lights, but they don't ever work. And, you know, you, <laughs> you, you come to a stop and you just got to, you got to, you know, you just got to be really careful. I have a lot of faith, man, you know, but, but that's a cultural thing. Yeah. You know? Um, and, and it's those kind of things I've, I've just come to, you know, to uh, appreciate and, Mm -hmm. and also, uh, I've come to see what the deterioration, you know, and the degradation of those things, um, look like over time. Um, and then on the other side, you know, I'm in a country, um, where, you know, there's, there's certain laws, you know, in terms of morality and things like that, um, are more like what we used to have, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, here in in the United States. So, yeah, I I just, I don't know, I I see things from a different perspective. Um, You know, we've been there for seven years now, um, and it's just been very interesting to see um, the changes um, and, and, and just to become more and more aware of, of what it means to be an American. I tell people all the time, if I've learned anything by living in Africa, it's that I'm not an African. <laughs> <laughs> it is great. It is great to see you. Yeah. We, we've known each other now for two or three years and yeah. have never had a chance to sit down face to face. It's yeah. a, it's an honor to be your friend. Yeah, it really is. And I, I appreciate it. I appreciate you know, our, our discussions, whether yeah. they happen in front of a camera or yeah. behind a camera, yeah. you know, and um, I'm, I'm grateful. God bless yeah. you. Thank you. Bless your brother.